We're going to move now to uh, Lift Up Your Heads, Professor J. Wesley Jones and the Music of Racial Uplift. Uh, Bob Marovich is the founder uh, and editor, editor in chief of the Gospel of uh, the Journal of Gospel Music, and the radio host and producer of Gospel Memories, a vintage gospel music program that has aired on Chicago's WLUW FM since 2001. He is also the author of A City Called Heaven, Chicago and the Birth of Gospel Music from the University of Illinois Press, and is currently working on a book-length history of James Cleveland and the Angelic Choir's seminal 1963 gospel album. Peace be still. Bob Maravich. Thank you, Tim. Well, I decided I'd better suit up uh, for this presentation because with the exception of this photo, I have never seen J. Wesley Jones in anything other than a suit and a tuxedo. So I thought if this is po possibly the first formal presentation on his life, I, I better not uh, underdress and, or for fear that uh, the ghost of J. Wesley Jones will haunt me for quite a long time. I want to take you back to set this in the context to 1931, the fourth Sunday in October. Imagine a line of people fashionably dressed all the way down the block waiting. Hundreds and hundreds of people. The, the, the line goes around the block, around the corner of the venue waiting to get in a half hour before the venue opens. And it finally opens, and they come in to hear not the symphony orchestra, not the lyric opera of Chicago, certainly not a rock and roll group in 1931, or a jazz band or anything like that, but the Metropolitan Community Church Choir, the prize-winning Metropolitan Community Church Radio Choir, under the direction of Professor J. Wesley Jones. Now, from 1917 to about 1961 in his passing, I want to say that Professor J. Wesley Jones was the rock star in Chicago's African-American vocal choir community, non-gospel, classical music, other kind of vocal literature. But why has he been forgotten? Let me ask you a question. Before you saw the presentation listed in the, in the brochure, how many of you had heard of Professor J. Wesley Jones in the past? Okay, actually that's better that I usually only get one or two hands, so that's very, very good to hear. Let me ask another question. How many of you had heard of the gospel choir director, Thomas A. Dorsey? Yeah. yeah. This is at the crux of my presentation because what we're gonna talk about is why I think he's been forgotten. Well, number one, and this is uh, germane to our group, one of the reasons that Professor J. Wesley Jones has been largely forgotten in time is because he made basically two recordings in his lifetime. One in 1925, and one with a limited release in 1932. Second reason is because he died in 1961, and so the individuals in Chicago, in any way, who may have been as young as being in his youth choirs for Easter services, for the Bud Billiken uh, services and the parade, would be in their 60s and 70s. But third, and this kind of is a different take than the former two presentations talking about resistance and, and, and protest, was that the music, the, the, the music of racial uplift as Professor J. Wesley Jones saw it and, and his contemporaries, people like Major N. Clark Smith and Professor Mundy and Edward Boatner, they came up at a time before the Great Migration and they saw racial uplift in terms of music as showing the world that African Americans were every bit as qualified, capable of producing writing, performing classical music, choral vocal literature as anyone else. Their understanding was one of racial amity with working in an integrated and assimilated uh, society. So this was kind of eclipsed by the Great Migration, right? When we had African Americans coming from the South to the North, unfamiliar with this middle class sound, this aspirational sound of African Americans wanting to sound middle class and upper class, what, what you would hear in Chicago, the term is called sedity, um, but to sound uh, as if they were going really uh, in line with the other uh, cultures. The migrants brought a different sound. It was a sound that represented the vernacular. It represented a lot of the remaining West African uh, pieces in the music, the blues, the jazz, then gospel, then rhythm and blues. 
So with the onslaught of all of those popular music forms, the pre-war African-American classical musicians have sort of been forgotten. But they were no less important, and we'll find out why. Let me tell you a little bit about J. Wesley Jones before we go on. He was born in Nashville, Tennessee, September 8th, 1884. His uh, parents were ex-slaves. He was raised uh, by a white family because he was orphaned as a child. Uh, then, uh, after about six years of being raised by this couple, he attended the Tennessee Industrial School for Orphans, where the principal saw his skills at music and got him a scholarship to Walden University, where he graduated with honors. He moved to Chicago in 1906, and this is an important date because this is 10 years before the sort of official start of the Great Migration. At that time, in Chicago, there were only about 45,000 African Americans. By 1930, that number was in the six digits, and the music was changing. But at the time that J. Wesley Jones came to Chicago, number one, classical music was still very much the predominant popular form of music. And it was his understanding in his own aspiration to be middle class that the right thing to do, the way to raise the race in Chicago to show people that African Americans had every right to be here as anyone else was to perform classical music uh, as everyone else did. He started uh, directing church choirs around the city and around 1917, he uh, got uh, to date his best uh, assignment at the original Fro Providence Baptist Church, where he became known around the African-American community for his ability to organize music events, such as this one, about 1918, where he took care of the music for Judge William H. Harrison's presentation at Bethel AME Church. Uh, and uh, these were just one of many programs that J. Wesley Jones was called on to organize. He also organized a group around this time uh, called the West Side Chorus, and then was asked to direct a group called the Progressive Choral Society of Chicago. And this organization was a fellowship of choruses to come together, learn from each other, learn vocal uh, culture from Professor Jones, and uh, generally get some ideas of, of performing assignments in Chicago. The Progressive Choral Society uh, has a famous alum. Her name is Mrs. Hattie Parker. So if you are familiar with the Pace Jubilee Singers, Hattie Parker was their soloist. She was also known as Eva Parker uh, on, on Victor Records for a couple of, uh, of uh, blue sides. The, the, probably the, the most influential assignment uh, Jones got was in 1920 when Reverend William Decatur Cook invited him to serve as musical director for his brand new church, the People's Church and Metropolitan Community Center. Reverend Dr. Cook was an AME minister who kind of got crossways with the AME denomination, didn't like the way they did things anymore, so he built his own church, originally set up on Giles on the left, and then at 4100 South King Drive, which is, uh, that building is still standing, although that is now the Metropolitan Apostolic Church. He hired, you know, at those, in those days, if you wanted to have a good church, you had to have a great music program. And so he knew that, and at the time, the predominant style of music for church in Chicago were classics. Uh, you didn't have gospel music. You had Bach and Beethoven and oratorios and anthems and uh, spirituals, the, cult, the, the sort of classical spirituals, the, uh, the ones, the, the stage spirituals, spirituals that we would hear from the Fisk Jubilee singers and that sort of thing, not the spirituals you would have heard in the 19th century, but the ones that were arranged or concert spirituals. So he brought, uh, Dr. Cook brought uh, J. Wesley Jones to be uh, his music minister. And the first thing Jones did was to form a choir because there were very few members of M M Metropolitan, so he had to do something. So he brought the Progressive Choral Society in to become their choir. And eventually members of the Progressive Choral Society joined Metropolitan and became their choir. In 1925, the Metropolitan at their prize-winning moniker when they won a competition among black and white choirs held at Orchestra Hall. They came in second place, and this was a, a significant deal in the African-American community, and in a sense of understanding Jones's racial amity, he invited not only the white judges, but the, the first prize white choir to join them for an after party after the program. Now you would think that winning this competition would have been the reason that they were uh, given the opportunity to record for Paramount, but in fact it was 
just a coincidence. They actually recorded uh, for Paramount in April of 1925 and the choir contest happened in May of 1925. However, that didn't stop Paramount from saying in June 1925, how wonderful it was we have this record from this choir, this choir that beat out all but one choir, white and black, in Chicago. It also gave the opportunity for Reverend Cook to be one of the first ministers to ever be heard on record. And if we could have track one, we'll hear a chance to hear uh, Reverend Dr. Cook uh, speak the uh, 23rd Psalm with the community choristers of uh, J. Wesley Jones uh, also singing. the preservationists here are probably getting a stomachache listening to that big crack, but I, I assure you that's the only record, I, the only copy I've ever seen of this one. On the other side were Lift Up, Lift Up Your Heads, which was Samuel Coleridge Taylor's composition and was sort of their signature piece. Next to it is the Paramount Records advert from uh, the Chicago Defender in June of 25, talking about how wonderful it was to have these great artists on their recording, except that they misspelled Reverend Cook's name, not only in the ad, but also on the label. Uh, track two, please. first heard this I realized this is a this is a church choir not tr tremendously accomplished but getting there lots of enthusiasm but I, I don't know also thought part of that it might have been the recording technique and I also don't think they probably bought all brought all the choristers in because at that time the group was about a hundred hundred members and it doesn't sound like a hundred members to me but um, in addition to lift up your heads uh, and arranged or concert spirituals the group at regularly at services at Metropolitan Community Church sang Bach, Sleepers Wake, A Voice is Sounding, Wagner, Shout the Clad Tidings, Beautiful Savior, Old Southland, they did Handel, they did operas. And in 1927, Professor Jones uh, was what brought the choir to be one of the first to sing on, African American choirs to sing on radio, sang over WLS, and they were on the second Friday of each month. And of course, WLS, proudly proclaimed that they could be heard in several states, including Canada. Now in 1930, and until his death in 1961, Professor J. Wesley Jones had probably was the biggest assignment of his life, and that was to direct the mass African-American choir of a thousand voices 
at Chicago's Chicagoland Music Festival. He also di directed a mixed white and black choir of 2,000 voices singing uh, the Hallelujah Chorus. The Chicago, has any of you had ever attended the Chicagoland Music Festival in the day? Okay. It was one day long. It was, there were tens of thousands of people who would come to a soldier field for all day of listening to music by professional and amateur. So you might have Dinah Washington, or you might have uh, Louis Jordan. Uh, you'd have Tony Bennett, Mahalia Jackson, Duke Ellington. They would all come. Uh, and you would also have people from various choirs and churches and, and, and schools, and they would get awards for instrumental or vocal. It was one day celebration of the arts in Chicago. Today, the one day ce the celebration in Chicago is about eating. Back then, it was about arts. But uh, the Chicago Land Music Festival was something that uh, throughout the years, uh, um, J. Wesley Jones worked with Thomas A. Dorsey. He also worked with Virginia Davis Marshall uh, as one of his soloists. And for you who are Sam Cooke fans, Virginia Davis Marshall wrote one of Sam Cooke's first hits called Lovable, but it was really called Wonderful, which was just sort of a popular song gospelized. This is, a, this is the only recording that we know of besides the 1925 Lift Up Your Heads that exists from J. Wesley Jones. In this one, he's directing the Thousand Voice African American Chorus at the Chicagoland Music Festival. Um, this actually comes from uh, an auction. Uh, many of you know very well what that is. Um, I was not the winning bidder of this, this piece, but the winning bidder was uh, kind to send me a, a photograph of it, although I, under a number of circumstances was unable to send me a, a dub, but at least we know it exists, and this was the only other semi-commercial recording available on James Wesley Jones. Now, 1933. Uh, was the celebration of uh, the, the World's Fair in Chicago, Century of Progress. And they had dedicated a day to African Americans. Uh, this is a long story that goes behind that. It's actually a whole other presentation. But in any event, the apex of that was an event that was put together by Noble Sissel called Oh, Sing a New Song. And it's, it's a little difficult probably for you to see the names, but it was important that J. Wesley Jones was among the people brought in to help uh, with W.C. Handy, uh, Harry Lawrence Freeman, Will Marion Cook, C.C. White, William Grant Still, Harry T. Burley, uh, Carrie Booker Persons, Walter, uh, James Mundy, Captain Walter Diet. These were the superstars of their day, and J. Wesley Jones was the last, next to last day, May 27th, 1937, there was an individual that um, recorded the entire thing. Sidney Robertson Cowell had the good fortune to record the entire day's worth of National Folk Festival artists. So you had uh, Polish artists, you had Scandinavian artists, you had African American artists, you had folk singers, you had country music, you had string bands, Cajun music, all of this recorded and happened to capture the last artist of the day, which was James Wesley Jones and the Metropolitan Community Church Choir, giving us, and I didn't even know about these recordings until last year, but on the Library of Congress website, there was a link to one of them. It's the first of them we'll hear. The rest of them have only been heard by one other person, and of course the engineer, <clears throat> so you as the audience are going to have a chance to hear uh, the, the community, the Metropolitan Community Church Choir sing these songs for the first time in almost 80 years. So if uh, we could play track three. This is from the 1937 National Folk Festival.
has not been heard since 1937. Before we play the last track, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about the soloist you're going to hear on the final track. Magnolia Lewis Butts had been working with uh, J. Wesley Jones since 1919 through his Progressive Choral Society, and she joined Metropolitan Community Church and had started uh, the W.D. Cook Gospel Chorus. After the passing of W.D. Cook, they named it after him. She, along with Thomas Dorsey and Theodore Fry, organized the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses in Chicago in 1933 and became uh, one of its primary uh, organizers until her death in 1949. In fact, people who remember Magnolia from the Dorsey Convention remember her being the glue that kind of kept everything together. Um, up to this point, we had, she did not record. She was very active and did many things in gospel music, but she had never recorded. But she also, uh, she studied vocal drama she could write plays, she could write musical plays, she could sing operatic, she was a contralto. And um, until recently, we just could never hear what she sounded like. So here's a recording of her, again, from the 1937 National Folk Festival with J. Wesley Jones uh, singing Couldn't Hear Nobody Pray, track seven. The 1937 National Folk Festival recordings, I think, more accurately de depict, de portray the Metropolitan Community Church Choir as they were known in Chicago. And even though music was changing by then, and it was becoming more gospel in the churches, 
Joan stayed in his lane and he continued to provide the fourth Sunday musicals, the annual musical that I mentioned in the beginning, people stood around the block just to hear. He stayed to that because that was him and that was of his generation. Um, and uh, I also thought it was great that if you can see here, Magnolia Lewis Butts actually made more money than J. Wesley Jones working for the church because she was a stenographer. So she made $720 in addition to her 144 working with the choir and he made 600. That was their 1939 role. So she was uh, doing that. But of course, you can't make money. You still can't make money in gospel music or church music. We all know that. So you had to do other things. J. Wesley Jones had taken the post office exam as early as 1914, rose through the ranks to become basically the first African-American in the United States to be postmaster of a branch in the Hyde Park area of Chicago. There he is in 1951 getting that appointment. Um, he also uh, was one of the first uh, choir directors to bring an African-American choir on television. When he, uh, on Christmas Eve, 1952, he and the Metropolitan Community Church Choir uh, and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra did a ceremony of Christmas carols and spirituals on WGN TV. J. Wesley Jones said in the paper that that was the highlight of his career was working with the Chicago Symphony on television. He died in 1961. Uh, he was well fated in all the newspapers. And, but I think probably the most poignant uh, tribute given to Professor Jones was at the Chicagoland Music Festival where he reigned supreme for 30 years. It was held in August, he had died in February, but at one point during the festival, and this is actually the 1961 festival, WGN radio announcer Pierre Andre introduced Philip Maxwell, who was the organizer of the Chicagoland Music Festival. Philip Maxwell asked that all the lights be turned out in Soldier Field. So if you could imagine, they set 100,000 people, lights out. The choir came out and in his memory sang, swing low, sweet chariot. The Reverend Esther Greer of Metropolitan Community Church said, during Professor Jones's lifetime, we enjoyed, I think, the greatest glory musically that has been enjoyed by any congregation in the city of Chicago. Thank you. We just have time for one or two questions. We can stay a little later if you'd like. Uh, uh, for any of the panelists up here, Sir, do you want to take the microphone, please? Just curious if you know more information about the circumstances these recordings were made under. Who was the recordist and why, why was he recording and what was he using? Um, I, I believe they were transcription discs um, and it's Sidney Robertson Cowell. I wish I knew the circumstances. I, I don't know that that person was particularly involved with the National Folk Festival, but uh, does any, maybe someone here knows. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Matt Barton, and I work at the Library of Congress. Yeah, Sidney Robinson Cowell, first of all, is a woman. Uh, she was married to Henry Cowell, the uh, composer, and um, she recorded extensively um, uh, for the Library of Congress, what was then the Archive of American Folk Song, and this is the, the era of the Lomaxes, um, but they were not the only ones making field recordings. And uh, yeah, she recorded that folk festival and others, um, there are many recordings by her on the Library of Congress's website, and uh, she had quite a career, made many contributions. I did not know about this, though, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, anyone else? Yes. Terry. I have a question. Hi, I'm Terry Brinegar. Um, you said that the first records, the one on Paramount, were racial uplift. They were trying to do like Psalm 23 and Assimilationist and all of that. But on their later recordings, they're singing Negro spirituals. So how do you explain this shift and why was there a shift? And how does that fit with racial uplift? Yeah, in fact, um, it was part and parcel of one and the same. Um, for Jones, uh, he considered the, the spirituals to be sort of African-American classical music. So. He and people like Professor Mundy and Professor Myricks, these are all sort of the major choral directors in Chicago at the time. They believed that uh, to preserve the spirituals in the concert format, the Western European format, would also demonstrate 
to the world the importance of African American music. So rather than, you know, later it was, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, right? Uh, but in their era, it was very much the sense of performing uh, classical uh, standards uh, and spirituals and showing the world that this was the, this was the pride and joy of African American music. I just wanted to uh, partly answer the earlier question as to the first record that you played. That was recorded by the Rhoda Haver Record Company in Chicago. Oh, great, great, I didn't know that, thank you. That makes sense, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Was it on Rainbow? No, uh, they did a lot of work for Paramount. And that would have been a session that they recorded specifically for Paramount. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, Alicia hey, Jones. Alicia, we know each other virtually. Yeah. Um, quick, easy question uh, to the honorific professor. Could you speak a little bit about the use of professor for people like uh, Professor Jones and even Professor Dorsey? How? popular that term was used for folks who worked with uh, African-American gospel choirs? Sure, that's a very good question, yes. Because uh, at first when I, when I would hear the term professor, I assumed that they were a university uh, teacher. But no, it was, it was very much a, a, a point of honor to, to show that you were, a, you were a teacher, you were an educator, not necessarily working at a college, but you were educating whether it was in music, whether it was in literature. So we had throughout uh, music, Professor Jones, you, you always, Professor Dorsey. Um, and then uh, as individuals got honorary degrees or, or PhDs, it was, prof, you know, professor or doctor. But uh, in fact, uh, Jones did receive an honorary degree later in his life. But yeah, professor was, was a, uh, an honorific given to people who had special uh, importance in the African American community as educators. You might say kind of griots for uh, the 20th and 21st century. It's still being used. One more, uh, any, no? Well, it's about 10 minutes to uh, uh, 12 now, so let's have a long round of applause for our three speakers. <laughs> <laughs>